Mr. Weicker, Worshiping the State is written with a sense of urgency. Can you talk about why it was important to write this book now? Well, uh, I guess to be frank, uh, uh, over the last, certainly over the last four years, I'm a little worried about this administration. Uh, and, and that, I think, is part of a long-term trend, as I outlined in the book, uh, that it is using more and more uh, state power to impose a particular worldview, a worldview I call liberalism. And I have, you know, that there's, we'll go to a definition of that so we aren't using terms loosely. Uh, but uh, as a Christian, I, I'm worried when the state uh, HHS uh, agency uh, wants to mandate that uh, Catholic institutions, I'm Catholic, uh, have to uh, pay for divorce fashions uh, in their uh, insurance programs. And I'm worried uh, when the Supreme Court starts taking up things like gay marriage. Uh, I'm worried about the things I see at the universities. So uh, I see more and more the, the state imposing a particular kind of agenda, and, and, and it's really a worldview. This, goes, this is bigger than politics. It's bigger than, than Republican and Democrat. It's a particular worldview, and that's the worldview I'm investigating in worshiping the state. Now let's talk about the title. What what does it mean? How liberalism became our state religion? Well, that, that's a that's a in a way a long uh, argument, but we'll we'll give a short account of it. Um, if you go back a hundred years or so, 100, 150 years, uh, you find what scholars call political religions, and normally they're referring to the advent of, say, for example, nationalism, or even going back further than that, the French Revolution. Uh, or later something like fascism, where they're taking a, uh, a secular state and that state is itself the object of veneration, even worship, uh, and there's, it's self-consciously that way. That is, uh, these secular states were taking the, the, the normal, natural uh, uh, desire to worship God and focusing on themselves in a self-consciously secular way. That is, it was simultaneously a rejection of Christianity an affirmation of what whatever their secular focus was. French Revolution, you know, liberty, fraternity, equality, uh, was a certain kind of religion of reason. Uh, nationalism, of course, pick your nation. Uh, Italy's a good example. Uh, Germany's obviously another one, the unification. Uh, and you have fascism in Italy, Nazism, communism, uh, but also socialism, uh, what I call soft socialism, which forms the foundation of uh, liberal democratic states in the West, Europe, more so, obviously. Uh, and then the United States itself, I think, more and more. And that itself has a religious foundation. That is, what I'm arguing in worshiping the state is, in a way, old in, in the sense that these scholars have been working on political religions for, for you know, actually since the mid-1920s, but new in that I'm asserting that liberalism itself, as we understand on the common level, is itself one of those political religions and in the same intellectual historical line as they are. And, uh, and uh, what you're seeing is uh, the establishment of a particular well-defined worldview, every bit as extensive as Christianity, which it is trying to displace. That is, uh, to be somewhat technical, goes from you know metaphysics, <laughs> what nature is, what reality is, what human nature is, all the way down to morality, uh, what is uh, marriage, what is human sexuality. So it's every bit as extensive as religion, and I'm arguing that we're seeing it imposed through the state. So it's functioning just like an established state religion. Uh, and so that's that part of the title. Uh, so you have the two together. You, know, the, you have the political religion aspect where uh, you, you really do have a kind of a religious background uh, historically. And then uh, a particular worldview, every bit as extensive as religion, taking the place of Christianity and imposing its own order, thereby pushing Christianity out of the public square. So... Uh, to really delve into the conversation, how do you define secular liberalism as a religion? And, you know, how do you see it challenging the Christian worldview in society? Uh, can I go with the second one first? Yes, okay. 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 <laughs> That's good. Oh, well, it, you know, one obvious way is, uh, you know, and we'll use old issues and new issues. One issue is, is abortion. Uh, another issue would be gay marriage. Uh, there's other issues, euthanasia. Uh, so you have a, a host of pol uh, political slash moral issues, and I think the best way to see the way it's challenging is to look at the large arc of history. Uh, my background is is uh, uh, is it has an historian of ethics, so that's the way I tend to look things first. You know, where did these ideas come from? What happens when they take hold? How are they related to each other historically? So if you if you stood back 
uh, from history and looked at the long arc, 2,000 year arc, um, and that's why I begin the book this, this way, oh, you see the Roman pagan empire, you'd see pretty much the same kind of a society that we lived in, live in now in, in regard to some obvious issues. Uh, the Romans had no problem with abortion, uh, no problem with infanticide, uh, no problem with uh, slavery, obviously. They had no problem with prostitution, with concubines, uh, homosexuality, pedophilia. Uh, there was even homosexual marriage. Uh, sexuality was completely unmoored from any religious foundation. They didn't, the, the religions didn't care. So, so you see a kind of moral worldview in ancient paganism, and Christianity was born into that. Christianity introduces a, uh, a, a radically different... <laughs> Uh, worldview than, than is supplied by ancient pagan thought, Roman pagan thought in this instance. Uh, and that's, a, it was as well defined and it took issue with these issues. Mm -hmm. uh, abortion was never an issue until Christianity gained hold in the empire. But it was an issue back then. Uh, nobody fought over it. Uh, neither was infanticide. In fact, uh, the Roman uh, law actually mandated infanticide, especially of deformed infants. Uh, infants were just left out and they'd be taken up into slavery or they'd just be, you know, they would just die. So you see the moral uh, transformation of the West in accordance with Christianity. Whether you're Christian or not, you can stand back from it and say, yeah, I see this happening. Uh, certain things now are held to be bad that before people were indifferent about or thought were good. Uh, and then beginning, well, actually, I, was, I argue beginning in the early 1500s, but certainly by the 1900s in the 20th century, the, the, the sort of arc of Christianity starts to descend as, as we have increasing secularization in the West. Um, that coincides with the rise of liberalism because they really are in many ways, if not always, the same thing. And you see the same moral issues. Uh, you see a clash between the Christian moral worldview and liberalism. And liberalism generally takes the side of the kind of things that were affirmed in the Roman Empire. So just as an historian of ethics, I can see that trajectory, and everyone else can. Not even have to take sides. You could be a Hindu or Buddhist and be from another country. You still see the same uh, uh, ethical transformation historically, which would look like a great arc. Uh, you know, Christianity transforms the West, and then it, secularization removes it, it, returns to its present position. So that's how I understand uh, how it is that uh, liberalism has become established as a worldview. It isn't just through the Supreme Court. It isn't just through Congress. It isn't just through education. It does occur through those things. But there, there's a, a greater longstanding transformation taking hold here. Uh, and it does result, I argue, in a, 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 an affirmation through the state of what amounts to an anti-Christian position. And again, this is something we can see by uh, just comparing the, the views that have taken hold and are now receding. So let's let's talk a little about the country's founding because you write about that in the book. And you know, the separation of church and state has become a beloved American concept. Um, you know, and some argue that it's helped religion to flourish in this country. You know, you have a more complex view. Would you talk a little bit about that? I do, and and probably it will upset upset everybody uh, because uh, there's there's a lot of confusion here. To, to begin with, a great point of clarification, uh, Christianity actually invented the distinction between church and state. I mean, that should be obvious from the name, church, state, church. There are no churches anywhere else. It's specifically a Christian term. It's not religion and state, it's church and state. Uh, but it has its ultimate origins in the Hebrew Bible and Judaism, in that fundamental distinction between uh, the, uh, the priest and the king. Uh, also, the notion that the moral law God gives stands above any particular nation and judges it, including Israel. That's important. You know, uh, morality isn't made by the law. <laughs> the laws must conform to morality. Uh, you also have no divinization of any human being allowed among the Jews. That's key. Why? Because you go to any pagan uh, area, the Pharaoh, right? The Roman Caesar, uh, Alexander the Great in Greece. Um, uh, you, you have a divinization of the emperor or, or the king. They're considered to be a god, they're also a chief priest. So you have a fusion of religion and political power. That's the normal situation for most of human history, a fusion. United in one man, Caesar was both the, the chief priest uh, and the emperor, but also considered divine. 
Christianity steps right in uh, following Judaism and makes it more intense. 